Hello everyone, I'm Patrice Brown, Zero's Vice President of Patient Programs and Advocacy. We hear from men and women every day who have important questions about COVID-19 and prostate cancer. So today, we want to answer as many of your questions as we can. I'm joined by Dr. Alicia Morgans, Associate Professor at the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University. She's also Chair of Zero's Medical Advisory Board, Dr. Morgans, thank you so much for being with us today. Of course, thank you so much for the invitation, Patrice. So it's very interesting what's been happening with COVID-19 and the way that it's impacted prostate cancer care and patients. Um, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network recently released guidance for prostate cancer patients, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic. What are the key takeaways for patients? I think the most important takeaways are that it's really critical for us to prioritize what needs to happen now and what can be safely deferred until a little bit later so that we can keep people out of the healthcare system, out of physicians' offices, and really safely self-isolating or staying out of um, the public domain whenever possible until things are deemed a little bit more safe. For example, things like routine biopsies on active surveillance can probably be delayed a few months and, and maybe uh, that, that could happen later in the summer, we hope when things quiet down. Or if people are anticipating starting radiation, maybe to defer radiation while we do a, a little bit of a longer new adjuvant hormonal therapy, which we're going to do anyway for those higher risk patients, would be a good idea. Um, so we're not really shifting such that we're not caring for patients at all. We just are shifting the timing when it's safe. Yeah, I think that's that's really important. We've been hearing so many questions from patients with specific situations. And so I'd like to dive into a, a couple of those because I think that'll help ease some fears. So let's say a man was just recently diagnosed with prostate cancer and he hasn't yet decided on a treatment plan. What should he be thinking about right now? Well, it really depends, I think, on how aggressive his cancer is and, and what his personal preferences are. So, for example, if he has a very low risk uh, Gleason 3 plus 3, grade group 1, prostate adenocarcinoma, active surveillance as it was before the COVID-19 pandemic is actually a great option and an option that will allow him to minimize his interactions with the healthcare system uh, maintaining his distance um, from, from those infections that he could get in clinic, but also monitor him in terms of his PSA and have planned biopsies in the future um, so that he didn't have a definitive treatment now. And as I said, that's actually a priority of treatment and recommendation for patients who have very low risk and low risk prostate cancer at, at any time, but is really nice during a pandemic because we can say we're both um, monitoring your prostate cancer, but avoiding those additional complications. For men who have higher risk disease, um, as they're thinking about whether they want to have radiation or surgery, um, these are going to have to be conversations with their physician team. And different geographic locations are going to have different restrictions in terms of whether surgery may be an option right now, or maybe that has to be deferred for a few months, um, or whether, again, radiation might be an option in the future, but we start a hormonal therapy in the meantime, which, again, we would do anyway for those uh, higher risk patients and, and defer the radiation for a few months until things have, have quieted down in terms of COVID-19. Uh, radiation is the kind of treatment where you actually need to go into a medical facility every day, Monday through Friday, to undergo your treatment. Um, and so it in itself doesn't necessarily put you at high, high risk for getting immunosuppression or, or not being able to fight an illness, but it's just that repeated interaction with the healthcare system that we would, we would hope to avoid. Um, for very, very high risk people, we do know that even in those situations um, where, where we know that we do need to treat, sometimes we can delay for a few months and not lose any ground. And, it, and that's a very personal conversation between a patient and, and his physician to make sure that you understand your risk benefit ratio. There will be some situations where a physician may say, it's, it's gonna be okay if we schedule our surgery, if that's the direction they wanna go um, in two months and we'll monitor your PSA and we don't expect that anything's going to happen. Um, and, and that's gonna have to be something that patients feel comfortable with. Um, and we do have data that, that there are situations, even in those higher risk patients, 
where we can delay for, for a number of months, sometimes six months, and actually not lose any ground. So it is always a balance between your safety now and your safety long-term. And those conversations are gonna be really important with, with physicians to make sure you understand your own personal balance. Yeah, and, and, and thank you for that. One of the things that we've heard from patients too is this idea of geography, right? So there are certain hot spots around the country right now with COVID-19. And some patients are wondering if they have the ability to, should they consider going to a place that's not a hot spot, let's say to get a surgery? What, what do you think about that and, and the conversations that they should be having with their healthcare team around that? So, you know, I, I think that there, there are definitely patients, again, who outside of a pandemic will travel to have a particular surgeon or, or you know, go a particular route. Um, that always is dependent on your personal abilities to do that. So if you have a family member who lives in the area and you think you really connect with a particular surgeon and you'd like to go to a, a, another area and you feel like you can be safe there, then I, I think that's reasonable. It's, it's always important to think about whether your insurance will cover that, whether you'll be able to continue to go back for follow-up visits, whether the travel will, be, will require flights, um, because we know that we're trying to get through COVID-19 right now, um, and airline travel can be really challenging and, and potentially um, a risk for people, or at least that's what we imagine, um, because we are enclosed in that container, essentially, with, with others, and most people are limiting flights. Um, so if, if over time um, there are still issues where it's difficult to travel by air, then you may have some difficulty getting back for follow-up visits. So, so it's, it's, there are a lot of aspects to consider. I think it's just important to remember that just because you have a cancer in you now does not mean that there's an emergent situation necessarily for, for most people who have a diagnosis of prostate cancer to have it removed now. It, it actually feels that way, I think, for, for, for people who have, who have heard that big C word, I need to get this out now. Um, but there may not be a medical reason to get it out now if it's safer to do it later, or if you could get it done locally if you do it later. So really, again, having those conversations, understanding your own resources, your insurance coverage, your ability to get back and forth for follow-up will be critical in making those decisions. But if that's the right option for you, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. So you've talked about having conversations with your doctor and how important that is. Um, as a physician, what are some of the key questions that you would want a patient to talk to you about? What are the, what are the, the leading conversation starters that patients should be thinking about? I, you know, patients often talk to me about decisions regarding systemic therapy. So they're choosing treatment usually for more advanced disease. So metastatic disease in most cases or recurrent uh, prostate cancer. And um, we talk about how different options for therapy may affect their risk for infection or their ability to do what they need to do in terms of self-isolation or their ability to um, stay a little more distance from, from the healthcare community versus having many frequent interactions. So understanding how often you need to be in the clinic, what your risks may be in terms of immunosuppression, what your laboratory follow-up might be in terms of requirements for testing are all important things that, that my patients talk to me about and that I talk to them about. Um, when we are fortunate to have choices between treatments, we try to avoid immunosuppression, or we are right now. Um, and we know that we will use drugs that cause immunosuppression for most people over time if they need it for their metastatic disease. And it, those chemotherapies in particular are incredibly powerful and effective in controlling prostate cancer. But right now, if we have the option, may not be the best time for them. So we talk about those kinds of things. We also talk about the risk benefit when, when it is time to use chemotherapy and how to best stay safe, um, how to isolate, certainly wash hands, um, how to avoid going out in public at this point um, is really, really important for those patients. And it's, it's funny because I used to have conversations about how people didn't need to stay home. They just needed to really have good hand hygiene and, and be careful. But that has changed because of COVID-19. Most of us, even when healthy, are trying to stay home or stay away from crowds um, because it's, it's really the right thing to do. Um, and, and it is definitely the right thing to do if you're on chemotherapy. 
Um, I do have patients who talk to me about localized disease as well. And so we try to think through how urgent is it for you to get treatment now versus how important is it for you to take some time now to avoid being in, engaged in the healthcare system really heavily versus later. So understanding the risks of now versus later um, is, is really a big part of other conversations that we have. Thank you. I think, you know, what goes along with that too is we're hearing from patients that are on sort of maintenance drugs and they're thinking about, should I get a 30 day supply? Should I get a 90 day supply? Trying to limit their um, trip to the pharmacy for either them or their loved one. Are there any risks with going from a 30 day supply to a 90 day supply? Well, um, not necessarily risks, but you may have trouble doing that with some medications. So there are a number of medications and this may change and actually is probably specific from pharmacy to pharmacy, but there are a number of medications where um, you can only get a 30 day supply. Um, this is very commonly the case with things like narcotics. Um, and I don't know that that has changed during COVID-19, although in certain parts of the country, perhaps that has changed. Um, and it's also true for most of our patients taking things like abiraterone or enzalutamide or apalutamide or darolutamide. These are oral agents that are all acting on the androgen receptor that stopping testosterone from feeding the cancer cells. Um, and those medications are commonly distributed in 30 day amounts, um, probably because they're very, very expensive and, um, and pharmacies need you to renew them each month to, to indicate that they're still working and that they're still needed. Um, I, I don't know if pharmacies are shifting to allow patients to have 90-day supplies. Most of my patients are still getting those at 30-day increments, but they have shifted to, to um, mail order if they haven't had that before, which can be really helpful because it does come to their door. Um, but anything that is outside of those two categories that you can have for a 90-day supply, I think is a good idea. Limiting, again, your interactions with anything um, is, is really, really helpful. And mail order can be really helpful too. I don't think there's necessarily any issue in having a 90-day supply as long as you keep your medications safe, keep them you know, in your medicine cabinet, keep them away from children. And of course, there are the child safety locks. Um, don't take more than is prescribed. Um, but I don't think that they'll go bad if you have you know, 90 days versus 30 days. It's, it's just usually for many of the medicines for prostate cancer, they're not dispensed in 90-day supplies. Um, but some supportive meds are, and so you can always, for those, uh, or for any medicine that they'll allow, you can always have them transferred over to 90 days if they'll let you. Yeah, and I think you, you bring up a really great point about the mail order for medication, because not all patients have taken advantage of that. And that really is a great resource, especially in times like this, when we need to be home and not out. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Wash your hands after you get the medicine out of the bag, um, but it is really nice to just have it at your doorstep instead of having to go out to get it. Yeah, so the other thing that um, a lot of patients are curious about is how are you interacting differently with your patients? We've seen a lot about telemedicine and how that's helpful. Given the kind of work that you do in oncology, has that changed for you too? It has. Um, I do about half of my visits right now by telemedicine. Um, our center has not, well, at least our practice, um, some other practices within our center have switched to video, but for the most part for our practice, we're all using telephone visits um, rather than video visits. There are all kinds, as you can imagine, of restrictions around HIPAA and, and personal information. So you have to have a platform that both the medical center and the patient have that's gonna be HIPAA compliant. And that's, I think, one of the reasons that we have not switched to video yet. But the tele telehealth or telemedicine has been really successful, at least from my perspective. Although I, I miss seeing people in person, there's a huge part of understanding how well or sick someone is that you can get within the first two minutes of seeing them, seeing how they move, seeing how they talk, seeing what the expression is on their face. And all of that is lost through telemedicine. Um, we do have to rely on what people tell us. Of course, we can listen and see how strong does their voice sound or you know, how, how calm or anxious do they sound, but there is something that is lost um, on telemedicine that I hope will not be lost long-term. In the short term though, telemedicine, as long as I 
still have access to labs and a lot of patients are getting those done locally and having those faxed in. Um, and as long as patients have um, blood pressure cups, which many of them are getting now, so they can say, okay, my blood pressure has been fine, don't worry about me. Um, it's, it's actually doing okay. Certainly patients who need to come in for infusion visits or injections need to come in, but it's interesting because we actually will check their labs, give them their injection, and for many of them, if they want to go home, they can go home and I still will call them on their scheduled visit or at their scheduled visit time and just do a telemedicine consultation. Because many men with prostate cancer are actually doing okay um, and, and we don't necessarily need to set eyes on each other every time they need to come in, but, um, but it is something that I think over the long term, we definitely either need video to have a much broader reach in terms of patients and doctors being able to do that, or we'll, we'll just need to switch back at some point to being uh, in person in the clinic because there is definitely something um, so much more human and so much um, so important about that in-person visit. Yeah, and hearing you talk about men taking their own blood pressure and doing some of the things at home, do you have advice for self-care at home given this time that we're in now? I, I do. It's advice that I probably need to follow better myself too, but self-care in general, very, very important. Taking time to get up and walk, whether it's outside or take some, some trips on your stairs in your own house, up and down several times a day, trying to get outside, trying to walk, get around, um, see nature, or at least feel the breeze. Um, I think it's really, really important um, to maintain both physical strength and health, as well as mental strength and health, because it can be really hard to be locked within four walls for potentially weeks, uh, which is what's happening here in Chicago. Um, and some families are big and places get crowded. And so there's also sometimes a need to just have some quiet space, whether it's outside or, or you know, personal time in your room and just read a book or sit quietly, write in a journal, do something that does not always involve people. That being said, many people need to see people. They're extroverts or they just wanna see their family or, or, or connect. And so um, if you can't see people that you care about, people that help keep your mood up, um, I think that it's important for us to reach out, call our friends. If you, if you have been going to support groups and those support groups aren't happening in person anymore, hopefully some of them are converting to things like Zoom and to other platforms so that you can still connect with the, the people that help support who you are and, and who you need to be. So both physical health, staying physically active, eating right when you can do it. And these are the things that we all have trouble with uh, normally, but you gotta do it. Um, and then mental health are two huge things about getting by when you have prostate cancer at any time, but certainly in the time of the COVID-19 pandemic.